If you've just come here for information on how to access the web interface on the Sonos system, you can do that by accessing these URLs. Uh, just just swap out the IP address shown there for the IP address of um, your one of your Sonos players and uh, go to port 1400 and then use one of these URLs and you'll find some stuff on there. But I'm going to start at basics here and then I'm just going to talk you through some of the stuff that you're seeing and just give you an idea of uh, how you can use the data that's displayed to you to uh, allow you to do kind of further diagnostics and just, just understand a little bit more about what you're seeing and what it means. Right, so let's begin at the let's start at the beginning and go into the Sonos desktop app here on Windows. Uh, you can do this equally via the mobile app as well. Uh, on the mobile app, I think it's under settings and then system and then about my system or about my Sonos system. Under on the desktop app, it's under help here and about my Sonos system. And all you need to do is find the IP address of one of your players. In my case, I'm gonna be using this one, which is the dining room. It's a, an old Play 3 device from 2011, but it is the one that I have connected to my router via an ethernet cable. A, a ethernet cable. So my system is just uh, an ethernet cable into one device and then Sonos Net out to all the others. And how can I tell that Sonos Net is used on all the others? Well, because I have this wireless or Wi-Fi mode zero on here across all my other devices. That tells me that Wi-Fi is not being used on them, even though it could potentially be used. I want to sort of make a distinction here between wireless and Wi-Fi, because of course, wireless, they, all the speakers are using wireless technology. You know, they're all kind of transmitting data wirelessly, but they're not using Wi-Fi in the true sense of kind of consumer Wi-Fi. SonosNet is using the same frequencies, uh, but it uses a different transmission protocol. It uses STP, which is Span Tree Protocol, and that is a mesh networking protocol that allows it to kind of jump, use the kind of strength of the individual devices to determine which is the best way of connecting to each other. I've got my IP address. Let's go from there. Need to go into a browser and go to uh, 192.168. I've got this in. I should have this in here. 150. And although there are a couple of URLs, as I, as I show, showed you at the start of the video, um, this is really the main one that most people will be interested in. Just for information, the reboot command, as you can see often online, because this is this information isn't new, right? This has been out forever. Uh, but some of the articles that are online are a little bit out of date now, and uh, the reboot command doesn't work anymore. They took that out of commission quite a few years ago now. There are also a few things that have changed with very recent devices too, and I'll uh, talk about those a little bit more in a second. So when you go to support uh, forward slash review, you get a list of all your devices plus a network matrix, and you can just expand these out, just toggle them on and off, and uh, each see a little bit more information for each of those devices. I'll go to the one that we're interested in, in here, which is the dining room device, and uh, the zone player info, info. It's called zone player because that's what they used to always be called. Sonos players they used to be called Sonos ZPs, which is our uh, zone players. When they uh, first came out back in 2004, <clears throat> even though ooh, so it's comp copyright 2003 here, actually, so maybe it's 2003. But um, yeah, so information about the device, very nice to have, software dates and ver full versions and, you know, Mac addresses and hardware versions and just stuff like that. You know, you don't usually need it, but it's just always interesting. If you're into this kind of thing, it's interesting to have this type of stuff. Ethernet ports, you got one... Um, one link on there because this is the device. Remember, I said that's plugged into my router. Normally, this will just say zero 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 if if it's just a standalone device. Speed is one hundred full duplex, and yes, they are one hundred megabits cards that are in these devices. Don't expect this to come up with a gigabit connection when you uh, connect it to your router. <clears throat> no Sonos device is a gigabit. They don't need to be. It's you know you're not missing out, so don't worry about it. Uh, they're, they're not gigabit and they don't need to be gigabit okay um version stuff here that's nice nice to see very good and here's some information about the stp stuff that's going on noise floors and all the kind of different tunneling to all the different devices that's nice if config well that's just a command it's a linux command it gives you information about all the networking devices so ath0 is a, your atheros device which is a chipset manufacturer of wireless devices. So this is the wireless card, basically. And um, what you'll notice, 
is that on all my devices, they say under received bytes and transmitted bytes here, they've all got zero. So if I go to, although they've been used, if I go to these, see, these are connected via, via um, wireless. They're connected on SonosNet, but they all have received bytes zero and transmits by, transmit bytes zero. The reason for that is because they're all connected via the Ethernet of the master, if you like, which is the dining room. So if I go down to ETH0, which is your Ethernet card, that's where the transmit information and receive information for this system is located. The rest of the stuff is just uh, internal to Linux, so bridge and, and local loopback and stuff, just standard networking stuff. And then again, we have more STP information. Sort of, I don't really know too much about STP, but uh, I know you kind of, if you have a managed switch, you can configure it to handle STP better than um, a normal unmanaged switch would. So I've got mine connected to a uh, just a normal regular router, which will be an unmanaged switch. So the cost and things like that of STP traffic can be incorrectly configured but to be honest i think most most unmanaged switches pass the packets just fine they just kind of ignore them they don't know what to do with them but they'll just pass them as they are and therefore these devices will have no problem kind of um, getting that information passed across you know move, moved across the network it shouldn't pose any kind of a problem all right moving on anyway the most interesting part, without a doubt, and the bit that everybody's most interested in, I think, is the network matrix. So let's open up the network matrix for my Sonos system here. And let's start on the left. We have our rows on the left. We have each of our devices listed in each of the rows and also the same devices listed in each of the columns. Funny that, it's a matrix. So yeah, that's kind of how matrix, matrix matrices, matrices work. So what does all this stuff mean? Well, MAC address at the top there, name of the device, and then you have a whether it's a tertiary node or a secondary node. And I'm, oddly, you don't seem to have any primary nodes. It kind of would make sense to me that you'd have a primary node if you have tertiary and secondary, but <clears throat> you don't. Um, my secondary node, you'll see, is the dining room, and that's the one that's connected via Ethernet to the router. So I'm guessing that makes the difference in that case. Then you have noise floor information, and the noise floor information is what determines the color of these boxes. And uh, they're, in my case, they're green and yellow. That's pretty good because you can have green, yellow, orange, or red. A noise floor, a lower noise floor, is naturally better because if you have a really low noise floor, it means you've got you haven't got much kind of interference or noise going on, and therefore you can have a weak signal but still have a decent signal to noise ratio, i.e. the difference in decibel level between the noise floor and the signal level. So a low noise floor means you can have a really weak signal, but still have it totally usable. And uh, you'll hear these kind of term, that terminology, you know, noise floor and signal to noise ratio mentioned when you're dealing with kind of DSL lines and stuff like that. The OFDM level, um, OFDM level here, well, I've only ever found a reference to this as saying, oh, it's a measure of interference. And to me, that's not a very descriptive way of putting it. So I'm afraid I can't give you any more information than that. I'm not sure exactly what it is. But what I can tell you is that uh, if it says OFDM ANI, like it does on all my devices here, then you have a level between zero and nine. And zero is the best. So I have one device here that has an OFDM ANI level of zero. It means the interference levels on this device and that this device is seeing are really, really good. The other way this might be represented is um, an OFDM level, which is the older way of looking at it. And that is that works the other way around, where zero is bad and five is the best. So it only goes between zero and five, I think, or one and it could be between one and five. So that's the information that's given to you down the left-hand side here. And the next thing you need to look at is which device is actually passing traffic through which other device. Now, I mentioned that the dining room was, was my master device. And because the dining room is actually fairly centrally located in our house too, it's also the device that most of the traffic is going through. So if you look down the dining room column, pretty much all the other devices are shoving their 
information directly through that because a mesh network will keep the level of hops down to a minimum if it can because it reduces latency. There's only one um, device that changes and that's the, this this one here, this 1SL device that's in Hugo's room. And physically that makes perfect sense. That one you can see is going through the kitchen. So the, um, the path that this Hugo's takes, it goes um, from that device into the kitchen device and then from the kitchen device into the dining room device because if we look at kitchen here, you'll see that that connects to the dining room. And that physically, as far as our house is concerned, makes perfect sense. However, well, what's also interesting to point out is that Hugo to the kitchen has a better signal level than the kitchen to the dining room. But yeah, so each hop have their independent signal levels. And this stuff, although the gray boxes here are the ones that aren't actually being used to transmit information at this current point, they all have signal levels um, with them because they have to know how well they perform to be able to be put into this matrix and be that that and for that information to be used to determine whether or not they should be transmitting information and should be the you know an extra hop in that mesh or not but let's take a look at this um, snapshot i took a bit a little bit earlier today <clears throat> where the dining room was actually the one being used for everything so even the device in Hugo's room was going via straight to the dining room. Now, lower latency that may be, but the signal was pretty poor. But noise floor on Hugo? Well, we don't know what the noise floor is on Hugo because the 1SL, the Wi-Fi card in that, September 2019, they no longer provide that information from what I can see. So these two devices here, Miles and Hugo, they're both 1SLs and they both don't have any noise floor information. But I'm presuming that this well, it was working fine, so although the signal level was much lower doing it this way, it only had one hop to do and that worked okay. I unplugged the dining room uh, device, turned it back on, and it reconfigured itself, and this is how it now stands. Arguably a better way of doing it. And finally, I thought to myself, well, okay, what happens if I plug another LAN cable into, say, the living room one? Will that make life better? Well, it doesn't really make that much difference, really. So here's the final result using a LAN cable in the living room. Now, naturally, you would expect a living room, so living room at the on the uh, row, living room row here. This is has its connection with the bedroom, and that makes sense because living room right is pretty much directly below the bedroom device. So yeah, those two are now communicating directly with each other, and apart from that. Um, which, uh, this is living room left. Okay, it hadn't pulled up the name by the time I did this snapshot. So yeah, so we've now got living room dealing with the traffic for living room left and the bedroom. That, again, makes sense to me. The rest of them are still going via the dining room. So yeah, physically it makes, makes sense this way. Uh, you've now got Hugo at a stretch still coming in directly to the dining room. If I redid this again, maybe if I unplugged it again, it could be that Hugo decided to go via the kitchen so we could have another variance on this kind of mesh network constantly changing. And that's the beauty of it. So hopefully this brief overview gives you some kind of idea of how useful a diagnostic tool this, uh, this matrix information is. If you've got any questions, as I say, put them in the comments. And um, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you soon.